Many people out there think that in order to forfeit your salvation, you have to do something crazy, something awful, you know, like murder somebody or rob somebody. But friends, you only need to do one thing in order to become an enemy of the cross of Christ. And it's this. All you have to do is set your mind on earthly things, the things of this world. And listen, these don't even have to be necessarily bad things. This can be things like your family, your job, your career, your home. And doing this can make you an enemy of the cross, setting your mind on earthly things. Listen to this. Paul tells the Philippians, For many of whom I've often told you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. See, that's it, friends. Just to set your minds on earthly things is enough to make you an enemy of the cross of Christ. I want to read a quote to you from a famous megachurch pastor, and it doesn't matter who he is. I'm not going to give the name because this is the way it is throughout America, you know, in, in mega churches throughout America and really most churches. So it really doesn't matter. But I want to tell you that this particular pastor that I'm quoting right here is regarded by many to be a conservative evangelical. And many would even say that he is radical and preaches somewhat of a holiness message. But yet he has this to say about his congregation and the churches throughout America at large. Guys, this is very, very shocking. Let's read it. He says, The reality is we live in a day where you cannot tell where the world ends and the church begins. Study after study after study shows that our lifestyles as professing Christians look just like the world around us. We're just as materialistic, just as sexually immoral, just as self-centered as the world. We're just as materialistic. Our spending patterns look strikingly similar to the spending patterns of non-Christians. Even our giving patterns are strikingly similar to the giving patterns of non-Christians. 6% of Bible-believing American Christians tithe. 6%. This is not just outside of us. This is inside. This is in this room. We know from giving patterns here that the overwhelming majority of people in this church do not tithe. We spend our money on all the same things the world spends money on. We're just as self-centered. We're just as sexually immoral. The percentage of professing Christian men who view pornography is virtually the same as non-Christian men. Men all across this room tonight have viewed pornography over the last week, in the last month, in the last year. We in this room are just as likely to have sex outside of marriage, whether we're single or married, it doesn't matter. Sexual activity with someone who is not your spouse is almost just as common among professing Christians as it is among non-Christians in the world. In marriages, you're just as likely to divorce as non-Christians, just as likely. Some studies in the past have even shown that divorce is more common among professing Christians than non-Christians. Other studies show that marital abuse is just as common. And in parenting, the priorities of professing Christian parents for their kids look virtually identical to the priorities of non-Christian parents for their kids. We card our kids all over town in the exact same way that non-Christian parents do. Teaching our kids, telling our kids to be good at the things this world says are most important. Namely, sports and entertainment. To spend hours in practices for this or that. To spend hours in video games, hours in front of the TV, and minutes, at most minutes, in the Word or in prayer with their moms and dads. The facts are evident.
guys. James calls people like this, worldly people, he calls them adulterers. He says, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Just like Paul told the Philippians, setting your minds on earthly things is enough to make you an enemy of the cross of Christ. John says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Jesus says, who, whoever does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Guys, these are strong, strong warnings. And these are directed towards Christians. James was writing to Christians. These were written to Christians. All throughout the Bible, it says strong warnings against worldliness. That you become an enemy of God if you focus your mind on the things of this world. A lot of people think that worldliness is really just an issue of, you know, atheists or people that aren't yet saved. And that once you're, once you become a Christian, you're plucked out of the world. And this, this really isn't as big of a concern. It can't really take you under. But friends, the exact opposite is true. This is so common. If we just look at the parable that Jesus told about the four different types of soils, we see the third one were those that were the seeds that fell among the thorns. They're those who hear, but as they go on their way, they're choked out by the cares and riches and pleasures of life and their fruit does not mature. And friends, we know from the verses prior to this, from verses 12 and 13, that this is talking about people that were saved. This is talking about people who had salvific faith, true faith. It equates faith here with a true faith that saves. And yet, these people had thorns that, that represented the cares and riches of this life that came and choked them out. And they didn't bear fruit. We know that those who don't bear fruit are cut off. Notice how, how it says here that just as they go on their way, this happened. This wasn't something that they necessarily did that was really bad. You know, like this doesn't say that they went out and murdered people. Okay, this says that they just lived their life. They just went out on their way. And as they went on their way, as they lived their lives, they were choked out by the cares and riches and pleasures of life. Friends, this is so easy. This is so easy for this to happen. To true born again believers, as it says here, these are true, these are people with true faith. This is why Peter warns us in 2 Peter 2. He warns us about going back into worldliness after we have escaped. Listen to this. He says, For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. See, they were freed. Or else why would it say again? They had repented. They had been freed from the world. And it says they are again entangled entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. Guys, this is serious. Listen, Jesus was tempted with worldly things. Why do we think that we would be above him? Satan tempted Jesus with worldly things. He tempted him with food, health, and power, wealth, and fame. And listen, these things aren't necessarily bad in and of themselves. Okay, It's not a sin to want food or health or even to have things like power. Okay, this, These aren't necessarily inherently sins. But for Jesus, it, like for example, food, he was told to fast. This would have been sin for him to go ahead and eat. 
because he was led by the Spirit to go fast. So in it depends on the context. And it depends on if you put these things above God, anything can become an idol. Anything can become something that will kill you spiritually, even something that's considered to be good. Then the, the devil tempted him with health. He, he, said, he said, hey, you can go ahead and throw, you can disobey God and just throw yourself off this cliff and you'll be perfectly fine. You'll be healthy. Everything will work out. You'll be okay. Friends, Jesus said, no, we're not to test God. The devil tried to get him to disobey God and convince him that if he disobeyed God, he could still be healthy. He could still have his health. And then he, he tried to convince him that he could have power and wealth and fame. And he tried to tempt him with these things. Just like this. If Jesus was tempted with these things, then don't you think that we are going to be tempted with these things as well? As we see, Demas, he fell in love with the present world. And he deserted Paul and went back into the world. This is all throughout scripture. True believers deserting the gospel, putting their, their hand to the gospel plow and turning back. And we know that anyone who, who loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. And Demas was somebody who was talked about as a, as a fellow worker in the other epistles. We see with the Laodiceans, Paul said that he struggled for them and that his co-worker was a witness that, that they worked hard for them. And yet Jesus came to them and said that they were wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. But yet, see, they didn't even realize this. Jesus said, for you say, I'm rich, I've prospered. I need nothing, not realizing that you are these things. They didn't even realize it, friends. Just like the quote that I read about that megachurch pastor talking about his own congregation looks just like the world. Friends, that's just like the Laodicean church. They didn't even realize it. And, and I, would, I would guess that most of the people there, as he was delivering that sermon, were saying to themselves, yeah, this would be a great sermon for, for this guy or for this person over here, but not me. See, they didn't even realize that they were wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Friends, there's going to be a lot of people on that day that are going to find out when they stand before Jesus, that they were these things. And they didn't even know it. They had deceived themselves. Jesus said to buy true riches from him. Friends, we are called to be aliens on this planet. We're called to look different than the world. And, and I know you've heard that, but I think that a lot of people don't really realize what that means. What that really truly looks like. And if we just look at Noah, for example, could you imagine what people would have thought about him when he was building that, that ark, right? I could just imagine somebody coming up to him saying, you know, what, what in the world are you doing? Are you building some kind of big house or what are you doing? And I could imagine him saying, well, no, see, actually I'm building a huge boat. And the guy would probably say, well, you're building it on land. What are you doing? This, this doesn't make any sense. And he'd say, well, actually... See, all these animals are going to come from all across the world and, and they're going to walk right on this boat and they're going to be all kinds of exotic animals. It, it, you know, this is what's going to happen. This is why I'm building this boat. And the guy would probably say, this makes no sense. Are, are, you, are you insane? Okay, so, so why are you even doing this? Why are you having animals come on a boat? Well, see, that's the thing. Um, see, God is actually really angry with you. And in fact, He's angry with the whole world. He regrets even making them. So what he's going to do is he's going to destroy the world. He's going to flood the world and kill you and everybody else on it unless you get in this boat with me. So, so what do you think? Uh, do you want to get on this boat with me and my seven family members so that you could avoid the wrath to come? Guys, people would have thought Noah was crazy. They would have called him all sorts of names. They would have looked at him and been like, what are you doing? Nothing you're doing makes any sense. You've been building this for how long? You know, decades? This makes no sense. This is how we are supposed to live. This is, we're supposed to have the faith 
of Noah. This is true faith. We're going to be looking like complete strangers to everybody else. If, if we just look at like even just aliens from another country coming here, you know, the things they do are so much different. They, they, they eat different things. They talk differently. They raise their kids differently. Everything's different about them. And that's exactly the way it's supposed to be with us. And even if we, if we just look at aliens from another planet, if we just look at that, if an alien came here, we would think, wow, you know, this is, this, this thing looks weird. Okay. Everything it does is just weird. That's what we're supposed to look like, guys. We're, we're supposed to be strange to everybody. And that's what Peter says. In 1 Peter, he uses the word sojourners, but this can actually be translated as aliens. He says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners or aliens and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Did you catch that? These passions of the flesh, these worldly things, wage war against your soul. Well, what would be the point of it waging war against our soul unless it could win? Unless, like it says in 2 Peter 2 that I just read, that if it overcomes you, then the, then the state that you're in now is actually worse than before. These wage war against your soul because these things can choke you out. These things can kill you spiritually. In Hebrews 11, it says, These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would not have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. So why was God not ashamed to be called their God? Well, because they had acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. So in light of all these strong warnings, that you know, setting your mind on earthly things can make you an enemy of the cross. That if you love the things in this world, then the love of the Father is not in you. That you can become adulterers for loving the things in this world and become an enemy of God. With all these strong warnings, what can we do? Well, just like I said in the beginning, when I quoted out of Philippians, that setting your mind on earthly things makes you an enemy of the cross, well, it's true of the opposite. Setting your minds on things that are above does the opposite. And that's what we're to do. Set our minds on things that are above, not on things that are on this earth. In Colossians, Paul says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. This is how we're to look at it. Setting our minds on things that are above, on godly things, not on things that are on the earth. And he says here that Christ is our life. But what does that mean? Well, anything that we truly want in this world is found in Christ. Christ actually has anything that we want. He's, he's our life. So there's people out there that maybe didn't have a father. Well, he's our father, right? There's people out there that, that want wealth and they seek after worldly wealth. But Jesus tells us to seek gold refined by fire to, to get true riches from him. Some people seek power and you know fame and, and that kind of thing and authority. But Jesus can give you these things. Okay, the, the apostles are going to be sitting and judging over the 12 tribes of Israel. And just like in the parable of the menace, as a reward for their faithfulness, they were granted authority over cities. See, everything that we truly want is found in Christ. Everything, friends. He's our life. But see, we have to humble ourselves 
We have to humble ourselves. Then it says that he will exalt us, not before. He'll give us the desires of our heart. That's true. But it says here in Psalm 37 that we are to commit our way to the Lord, trust in him, delight ourselves in the Lord. Then he will give us the desires of our heart. Everything that we truly want is found in him. Do you understand that? Do you believe that? This passage right here helped me so much, guys. This During a time when I was lukewarm, God showed me this passage and helped me to realize that everything down here on earth is just a small blip in light of eternity. That really all of our focus needs to be set on eternity because, guys, this is just, this is such a small, small blip when you compare it with eternity. It says in 2 Corinthians, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. See, it's beyond all comparison. Anything we've ever seen. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Do you have this mindset? You know, a lot of people, I've had some people come at me and say, you know, so what if Christianity isn't true and you you do all this stuff, you know, you, you um, beat your body to keep it under submission and you discipline yourself and you abstain from all these passions of the flesh and then you find out after all that, that God doesn't exist. But look at it this way. Look at it this way. If he doesn't exist, which he certainly does, then look at it a thousand years from now, a million years from now, a trillion years from now. Does it matter anything that you did here on earth? Does it matter if you just become dust and nothing more? No, it, it doesn't matter. But if on the other hand, you find out that everything in the Bible is true, that Jesus did rise from the dead, which he certainly did, and you stand before God, and you have to answer to him. Think about it then, okay? And think about it in light of eternity. Think about, like I said, a million years down the road. Are you focused on that? Are you focused on the true riches? This is why Paul in Romans 12, he says that we're to give everything, okay? In light of this truth, we're to give it all to Jesus. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. That's to present everything we have, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. See, focusing on the things above, not on the things of this earth. So that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. But see, a lot of people, just like in that quote that I read from that pastor earlier at the beginning, most of those people, I believe, don't even realize that they're wretched, poor, pitiable, and blind. And I think that's the case with most Christians. And that's why we can fool ourselves into thinking that we are giving everything, that we are truly fulfilling the call. But friends, it's not us that decides that. We, we don't get to decide that we're doing enough. It's Jesus that decides whether you're doing enough or not. Just like he told the rich young ruler. For him, he said, give up everything and then come follow me. It's Jesus that decides what you're to do with your life. You're to lay everything at his feet and say, are you pleased with my life? Are you pleased with this sacrifice? See, it says in, in Psalm 26 to prove me, O Lord, and try me, test my heart and my mind. We're to have him test us because we can deceive ourselves. And over and over and over again in the Bible, this Christian walk is referred to as a race. Just like in Hebrews 12, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. 
You see, it's a race. It's a race to be run. Yes, we've been plucked out of the world. But now that we've been plucked out of the world, now it's time to run. This is the Christian walk. This is the narrow path to begin to run this race. As Paul describes it in 2 Timothy, he says, Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits or you know the things of this world since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. So Paul assumes that the Lord will give people understanding in this, but friends, I think many people don't have understanding in this. And they have to ask themselves, why? See, this right here is a beautiful example of how our Christian walk is supposed to be. Because a lot of people, you know, tend to go on one extreme or the other. They say, okay, well, I I have to literally get rid of everything and I can't enjoy anything worldly whatsoever. And then other people go on the other extreme and just say, you know, hey, anything goes. But this right here gives us a really solid example of how we're to live how we're to live in this world. And he compares it to a, a soldier that doesn't get entangled in civilian pursuits. So just think about this analogy for a second. If you're a soldier and your aim is to please the one that enlisted you, or in this case, it's representing God. Soldiers don't get, they're focused on the mission. They don't get sidetracked by every little thing. They're focused, they're disciplined. They wake up at a certain time. They, they, they're sure to work out. They're sure to train because they have the mission in mind constantly. Now, this doesn't mean that they can't enjoy certain things from time to time, but their overwhelming focus is going to be on the mission, is going to be on, on pleasing the one that enlisted them, their generals, right? And then he says, just like that, he compares this also to an athlete, So say like a marathon runner, a professional marathon runner, who's training to win the prize. Well, think about it like this. A professional marathon runner, there are times where he's going to enjoy the things of this world. And that's that's not a sin to enjoy the things that God has given us. But overall, his mindset is going to be train, train, train. He's going to be focused. Okay, He's going to be waking up at a certain time early each morning. He's going to be reading magazines to figure out how he can just get that much better. He's going to be disciplining his body, making sure he eats the right thing, making sure he works out, doing all these things to make sure that he wins first place because that's what he's going for. He's going for first place. Friends, he says that this is what God is supposed to give us understanding in, that this is how we're supposed to be looking at it. There is no other way. We're to to run this race as if we're trying to get first place, okay? Not not second or third, or hey, you know, as long as I get to heaven, I hear this, I hear people say this, hey, as long as I get to heaven, I don't care about, you know, rewards and this kind of thing. Friends, you're deceived. This is a race that everybody has to run. Nobody's exempt from this. He says, the Lord will give you understanding in this. This is how we're supposed to be viewing it. Now, these people they still can spend time with their families, okay? That's not sin. We are to love our families. We're to love our children. We're to disciple them. We're to honor them, our wives, right? But, and and we can even do certain things with them. It's not a sin necessarily to go to a movie. I mean, it depends on which it is, but you got to think about the mindset. They're going to they're gonna throw everything off to the side if it's at all possible. They're not going to be coming home and spending four hours on Facebook. Okay? They're not going to be coming home and watching a couple hours of TV every night. Why? Because their, their mind is so focused on the mission. Their mind's so focused on the race. They don't have time for these things. So friends, if you have time for these things, then are you really running the race? That's the thing. I, I just don't even have time to do these things, to get involved in these things. Because I'm thinking, I have my mind set on things that are above. I have a mind set on who else can I bring to the kingdom? How, how can I be just that much better 
at witnessing to somebody. What else can I do? I'm, I'm leveraging, you know, whatever, whatever I have to be able to advance the kingdom, my time, my energy, you know, resources. This is the mindset that we're to have. And if you don't have this mindset, like Paul says, the Lord will give you this understanding. If you don't have this, then ask yourself, why? Why don't you have this understanding that's been given to you from the Lord? Paul puts it like this. He says, this is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. And those who mourn as though they were not mourning. And those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing. And those who buy as though they had no goods. And those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. This is how we're to look at things. And this is right after Paul just got done explaining that it's actually better if you don't get married. Why? Because then you can serve more time. You can spend more time serving God and furthering the kingdom. This is the mentality that we're to have, that it's actually better to not get married if it's at all possible. Now he says that it's not a sin if you get married, but your loyalties are going to be divided. You're not going to have that extra time to be able to witness to people, to be able to serve God. This is very um, alarming to many because he says, let those who mourn, mourn as though they were not mourning. Wow, we're to have that kind of mentality. That even when we're going through trials, we're to just, we're to be kingdom focused. We're to still be just pressing ahead, thinking about the kingdom, thinking about God, thinking about bringing people to the kingdom. This is how we're supposed to walk the Christian walk. And lastly, all throughout the Bible, the Bible warns us to not fall asleep. Jesus says, but watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life. And that day come upon you suddenly like a trap, for it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth. But stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. See, he says, but stay awake at all times. This theme of staying awake is all throughout the Bible. Well, see, if we get weighed down with the things of this world, it's going to cause us to just slowly fall asleep. And this is the danger. See, this is what makes it so dangerous. We can, it's so easy to just focus on the things of this world. I mean, we have to do certain things. We have to eat. Okay. We have to go buy food. We have to go buy clothes. We have to, we have to do things in the world. And this is what makes it so tempting. And, and it's just like, if you've noticed with YouTube, it will suggest, the algorithm will suggest videos based on what you started watching. So if you start watching worldly videos, guess what? It'll start feeding you more and more of them. It keeps feeding you more and more until all of a sudden you look at your YouTube feed and it's just nothing but worldly videos. And you're like, how did I get here? See, then you, then you got to snap out of it. You got to wake up and say, no, no, wait, I'm on mission. I got to get back to the mission. This is how easy it is to fall asleep, especially if you have the things of this world, you know, the amenities and riches of this world. It's so easy to fall asleep. You have to try so hard just to stay in the race and not just lounge off and go to sleep. That's why these things weigh you down, friends. And you got to be thinking with this mindset, what can I keep from weighing me down? How can I, how can I stay focused? How can I not fall asleep? Because it's, it's so easy to fall asleep. If you just notice in the natural how easy it is to fall asleep, especially, you know, if it's warm, you've got a full belly, you're comfortable. It's so easy to just drift off to sleep, friends. And that's exactly how it is spiritually. If you have the things that keep you comfortable, it's so easy to spiritually just drift off. Just drift off back into the world. And that's all it takes to become an enemy of the cross of Christ. That's it. Just to slowly go back into the world. 
And the Bible says that you become an enemy of God. If you love the things of this world, the love of the Father is not in you. Friends, think over these things. Take heed to these things. Don't fall asleep. Don't let your mind wander off into earthly things. Stay focused on the mission. Stay focused on the race. Just think over these things. That's all I got for today. Please go ahead and like, subscribe, share. God bless.